the modern day conveniences that liberalization of the country brought is huge right i mean we are all living it and enjoying it but along with that came the bane of some of these lifestyle diseases living with diabetes worldwide people have high blood sugars there's an increased risk of cancer one out of three adults have high blood pressure propensity of people to have these issues post covid has increased what we've realized in a post pandemic world is that loneliness and social isolation is the new sitting and the new smoking but we're hearing of so many people getting stroke nowadays in 2020 65% of the deaths in the country were due to ncds our body is very interconnected when you have such vigorous activity the lung and the heart have to be in such sync okay. so let's not mistake a fit body for a healthy body It's the first time we unfold a whole new dimension of healthcare. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to welcome our distinguished guest today on the Health Shot podcast, Dr. Satya Shriram, CEO of Preventive Healthcare at Apollo Hospitals, and Dr. Manish Mathu, Karnataka Region CEO of Apollo Hospitals. They join us on a journey where we talk about preventing serious health conditions, recognizing and managing potential health risk early on. through advanced ai shaping a better quality of life so sit back and enjoy as we unravel the secrets of a healthy life with apollo pro health uh first of all thank you so much for having me here dr ryan um i work as regional ceo with apollo hospitals i'm based out of bangalore the most happening city in the country today um and um you know this year our focus is largely on pro health and how we drive wellness uh, in the city and across the country very happy to be here awesome Dr Satya it's a privilege to have you over here tell us a little bit about how you landed into this seat of preventive healthcare thank you so much ryan absolutely delighted to be here um at apollo hospitals as uh, heading the preventive health vertical um my mandate is to help shift the consumer mindset from curative to preventive and uh, i bring sort of deep passion for driving consumer behavior change um and i think that's the crux of uh, changes to lifestyle the only thing that we can control if we want to be healthier tomorrow than we are today you know whenever we have conversations in the corridor everyone's talking about how india is the seat of ancient wisdom we discovered the zero over here mathematics center of the world and obviously the ayurvedic sciences are thousands of years old and so i'm assuming that this ancient wisdom would have trickled down into our subsequent generations what we're noticing is that we are getting a lot of these non communicable diseases in the ancient time we had diseases that killed us because of typhoid or malaria but now we're getting rammed by stuff like diabetes and hypertension and heart attacks so is this on the rise and what do you think doctor went wrong since ancient wisdom and now modern sickness ryan the non communicable diseases which um, typically cover diabetes hypertension cancers um obesity as well as now increasingly mental health are definitely on the rise um if we take uh, the indian population back in 1990 so as recent as 1990 25% of the deaths in the country were due to the ncds or non communicable diseases 25% that means one fourth of our population was dying because they were slapping their own selves <laughs> yes of, right? yes kind so, of it <laughs> i i couldn't get it from my next door neighbor or my auntie or my uncle i brought it upon myself upon ourselves and at that time the infectious diseases uh were about 65% of the uh deaths in the country I think medical technology access to vaccines a lot of um, awareness about some of the communicable diseases has resulted now in the these diseases going down and the non communicable diseases on the other hand have been steadily increasing 
in 2020, 65% of the deaths in the country were due to NCDs. So we've gone from 25% to 65%. In 1990 to 2020. So the ancient wisdom of Ayurveda is now just a lovely nameplate on our board of India. But internally, we are getting sicker. And we are not getting sicker because of infectious diseases. It's, it's these lifestyle diseases. That's right. I think, um, just to add on to what you said, uh, lifestyle changes that we've had uh, in the last 20 odd years, rapid urbanization, pollution, alcohol, smoking, uh, processed food, right? And uh, sedentary lifestyle. Um, while, you know, we may be aware more about our health today, but I don't think it's um, in our behavior, it's actually something that we are abiding by. So I think all those things are actually leading to a rapid increase in NCDs. And 7 out of 10 deaths today in, in the world happen because of NCDs. So 7 out of 10 deaths in the world happen because of non-communicable diseases, which basically is you don't get it from something. You kind of inflict it Absolutely. upon yourself. So where do we act? Where do we act? Do we wait till we get that slap? And in your case, you're giving me statistics of death. So does a person need to wait till they die and then act? Or I know I'm joking about something about death, but people need to wake up and get serious. So where do I get serious? Do I get serious uh, at the first sign of a symptom? Do, do I get serious when I faint and fall down? So as doctors, uh, you know, practicing this mantra of not curative medicine, but preventive medicine. Where do we start? How do we get people to get started? If you see a symptom, it's already, in my mind, a tad bit on the later side. Doctor, if I can interrupt you. For the layman out there, symptom, what do we mean by symptom? A symptom is something that you feel is off. And that means it could be a pain somewhere, a discomfort, away from the normal way that something is functioned. Example. You have a pain in the gut area or your digestive processes right, and bowel movements are irregular. You have pain in the chest area. All of these are examples of symptoms, something that you can feel, visibly see sometimes, touch. This is what it is, is a symptom. And when we say you come in after a symptom at that point, like I said, it's a little bit on the later side. Our body is actually built to be very, very resilient and therefore can compensate for a lot of the abuse. Is that why a lot of us have this God syndrome that we are indestructible? Yeah, absolutely. Therefore, we ignore the symptom? Exactly. Or symptom or the, even the path towards that, right? You sort of start getting a little bit of a niggling feeling. You know something is off. The sleep is a little bit disturbed. But you choose to procrastinate and push it out until it becomes something that's really tangible. At that point, it's a symptom. Let's take an example. Um, one of the rising conditions um, in India is fatty liver. When we think about a liver transplant or liver cirrhosis, automatically most of us think about alcohol-related yeah. liver cirrhosis. I, I drink a lot of alcohol and my liver goes off. Right? Our... Uh, liver transplant surgeons say these days for every alcohol-related liver transplant they do, they do one for non-alcoholic fatty liver conditions. Ah, so what you're trying to say is that just because somebody's smoking or drinking, in the previous time we doctors said, oh, this guy is going to get alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now you're saying even without drinking, they're getting it? That's right. Even without drinking, they're getting Fatty liver conditions. That's different from the alcohol-related cirrhosis. Let's unpack this a little bit more. Mm. How a liver gets uh, becomes a fatty liver is essentially due to excess carbohydrates. Right? Because the first place of storage for excess carbohydrate, when it's converted into something called glycogen, is the liver. It's only when the liver's capacity to hold that excess carbohydrates is surpassed, does it actually go and settle in other places? Now, when there's excess accumulation of these carbohydrates as glycogen in the liver, there are structural changes to the liver. 
and that can be only picked up in an ultrasound. It will not show up in a blood test or the, of the liver function test. That's much, much later. When the liver has stopped compensating for this and says, I give up, I give up. And that's when the liver function test starts to be abnormal. But if you do an ultrasound, you can actually pick up the structural changes much earlier. Doctor, for the people that don't know, what is this ultrasound? Yeah. Ultrasound is actually an imaging technology that uses sound waves to help visualize what's going on inside your body. But why would somebody do this? So typically we have heard uh, doing an ultrasound for pregnancy related. Yes. Right? Look at the, look look at the, the baby, baby in, the, in the womb and so forth. Um, but what we found is the ultrasound of the abdominal region actually picks up a number of abnormal uh, conditions in, in this area. So stomach, gallbladder, liver, pancreas, ovary, uterus, right? All of these get picked up in an ultrasound. Also, you could do an ultrasound of for kidney stones, for kidney stones gallbladder stones. Also, carotid arteries, sometimes you do an ultrasound to be able to see. Where, where is the carotid artery? It's around here in the, the neck. neck. So, so the one in the neck. That's yeah. right. Why would we screen an ultrasound for the neck carotid artery? This is for typically for stroke. You know, but youngsters will be like, I'm not going to get a stroke, but we're hearing of so many people getting stroke nowadays. So if I'm in the 20s to 30s, 30s to 40s, or 40s to 50s, are we doing this ultrasound or this, uh, you know, the checking of my neck artery and all? Who tells me to do this? Yeah. So also, Ryan, you don't do everything for everyone at all ages. Okay. Right? Different uh, people have different risk factors, different age milestones you actually, the in, a, a risk increases. So we actually can um, think about a combination of tests that are most appropriate for each individual or group of individuals. Okay, got it. A and if I can add to that, you know, recently in our ProHealth packages, we've launched age-specific packages. So, um, you know, the most popular tests that people opt for are whole body packages. But essentially that used to be restricted to, you know, 40, 50, 60 days to kind of, be more, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uptake used to be more in these age, this age category. But now we've realized that, you know, as as you said, the onset of this disease is also in the younger age group. So we've curated packages for our younger age group as well. So how young? Have, 20 to 40. So if, yes. even a 20-year-old yes. to 30-year-old can come in and get tested? Yes, yes. And we've curated the packages based on the disease conditions that are most prevalent in that age group. So we have that's that's very interesting. You know, recently I was working in one of the Fortune 500 companies and they contracted us to do the nutrition plans for people. Right. And we just asked for a basic blood test of the 20 to 30 year olds and we found that more than 67% of the blood tests that we did had very high blood lipid profiles. profiles. Yeah. Yes, yes. And the, the the youngsters were shocked. Yeah, yeah. So that's also part of our genetics as South Asian population where we are more prone to higher cholesterol. You know, what could be some of the modern day reasons that the 20s to 30s and 30s to 40s are facing these current lifestyle diseases? What from the air or from the water or from the food or, or is it my karma bumi or something that is causing this? So as doctors screening thousands of people, you are seeing statistics. So you obviously are like Sherlock Holmes and you will have an inference. What are the modern day conveniences that are putting a target on people? One, I think, to add to Dr. Satya's point, genetically we are predisposed to more coronary artery disease. So I can, blame, I, I can blame my grandfather, grandmother. But only that's part of the story. Yeah. I would say even in our genetic testing protocols that we have well established in our pro-health program, uh, genetic screening results have shown us that that predisposition causes only one fourth of the contribution to the overall illness of the person. The others are, you know, your lifestyle. Like so, 20, said, twenty-five percent I can blame my ancestry ancestors gene. for that, and seventy-five yeah. percent is my it's domain. mine, which is your, you know, dietary intake, your sedentary lifestyle, pollution in there, you know, uh, and the kind of food that I'm eating. And of course, while we may be aware about our, you know, health needs, but we are not really, uh, you know, doing much about it. Uh, like we see, we are you know, more leading a lot of sedentary um, lifestyle choices. Um, I think those are contributory factors. 
also indians genetically are insulin resistant more than caucasians that leads to you know high predisposition for diabetes and of course uh, you know resulting impact on other other organs as well so that i think something we really have to watch out for so dr manish what i'm hearing and what all our fans are listening in is that okay at 25% i can blame my family genes i still want to blame my family yeah. maybe for my diabetes hypertension cataract ye wo all of those things right but as a young adult should i screen when should i screen and what should i screen for for this blaming my family part or let's call it genetics <laughs> So um, because I think if I know that I'm going to have something that has a risk factor right I'm hoping we are smart enough to say that I inherited it but I won't activate it so what could we be doing uh, as tests so Ryan I'm going to share a personal anecdote here I actually did my own genetic sequencing and uh, some of the results that uh, actually stood out for me and made me change my behaviors right um first i realized that i had a um, higher likelihood of developing hypertension which is blood pressure so that's something that i realized as part of my genetic profile i therefore now regularly take my blood pressure every week now it also helps that i'm in a hypertensive household and everyone goes around passes the bp meter and uh, we now make it a ritual i knock on wood don't have it yet but because that genetic sequencing result told me that i'm at a higher risk than the average indian i now do this regularly i'm hoping that i can catch any rising trend so not at any given one point but a rising trend that then allows me to um address it well before it becomes a problem so you did the testing know that you have a hypertensive kind of gene and you're now screening with a bp monitor so you're you're doing it proactively Are you changing anything yes. in your life? Yes. So let me give you an example of another gene that uh, was identified where apparently I have a tendency to add more weight with high fat foods. Ah. Oh. The minute I saw that I had a red or higher than the average Indian. It's automatically made it somewhat tangible for my brain to process this as something that's not good for me. and since then i have been watchful so when dr satya sees a samosa on a plate <laughs> she's like you're not worthy to add to my body right I, now i actually ask am i allowed to enjoy that this week so let me rewind slightly with you because i want our listeners to understand that you're a ceo of apollo preventive healthcare and you're making changes because you've understood the crystal ball gazing into your future which is if you were younger did you eat a samosa with a bandit and yeah. now with this knowledge is it making you realize that your body is the most expensive real estate it's not changeable and therefore you have to make some changes is is there a difference between the younger version of you and now the more wiser older version of you absolutely i actually developed kidney stones oh very young okay and uh, that was a wake up call for so a everyone very, very has a wake up diet. call at yeah. some point in their life and now in my 40s the number of things i know i really wish someone had uh, slapped me awake <laughs> in my 20s and told me the few things that i needed to change uh, so that i could enjoy these um, unscrupulous behaviors every now and then and you know i think that brings us to the point that 20 years back we, we didn't have the luxury of genetic testing today's 20 and 30 year olds have that luxury and they must use this because it's very important to get that tested in the early years once the disease onset happens you know then you can only reverse the disease but if you get the testing done in time you can actually prevent the onset of diseases so you know i so much agree with both of you um when we studied in our younger years we didn't have the access to the internet mm. today's generations have technology right a much smarter generation like uh, you know if you have a laptop that's running only at 60% you upgrade it to a new laptop that yeah. runs at 120% so i think this younger generation is quite smart and once they begin to realize that i can have a crystal ball gazing into 
my RAM processing speed right. or what back foot do I have in my sure. body. Sure. So I also did my gene testing and I discovered that I'm gluten intolerant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wrote a whole book about it called Wheatless. Why? Because when I was a teenager, nobody told me that I should avoid milk and gluten. And so I got acne hammering me late into my 30s. And when I did a gene test, that too which was sent to America, many, many years ago, the guy called up from there and was speaking Hindi and he said, Bhai, aap to goan hai yaar, aap to pao nahi ka sakta hai. So you can't eat bread. Who's told you to eat bread? But who's going to tell me culturally yeah. that my dadi ma and my, uh, my grandfather were at two wrong different locations? So yeah. we're done blaming our genetics and our parents and our grandparents. But um, if we look at statistics from the medical industry, and I'm sitting on this side of the lens, what are the lifestyle diseases statistically that as an Indian I should be looking at for? So, which is the which is yeah, the top gunda? Top gunda. I would say pre-COVID, the top gunda was you know the cardiovascular diseases. So, cardiovascular for the layman is hypertension, coronary artery diseases, you know, um, uh, blockages, artery blockages. So basically, everything to do with the with heart, heart and the yeah, pumping of the heart. That was uh, the most common. Post-COVID, we've seen a massive shift towards cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, um, stomach cancer among males, and in females breast cancer, cervical cancer, and then lung cancer, in that order. So that's what we see most prevalence of, but also mental health. So what is the age group of people that come in for the preventive health checkups, like broad picture, as uh, young as what and as old? As young as 25, as old as, I mean, there's no... I so would say so if a 25-year-old is listening in, they can actually make the effort to come in and get screened and tested and everything? Absolutely. I think as a habit... We have to incorporate that early on. And as you rightly said, at, you know, in the early part of the show, we shouldn't really wait for something to happen to us before we take that test. I mean, just think about it. We get a car service thrice a year, four times a year. But I know of many adults with strong family history not getting themselves tested for, you know, years together, which is, I think, an extremely dangerous state to live in. You know, this is just popping up in my head, which is we get so many people saying that, right? I do not want to know. As a medical doctor, I mean, you guys will see the worst of the worst, right? And now you're sitting on the side of the fence where you're saying, if I throw a ball, I know where it's going to land. Yeah. And this person saying, I don't want to know where it's going to land. Yes. What, what do we say to such people who are sitting yeah. on the fence saying, I don't want to know, I want to enjoy my life. But then they're hurting the whole family after that. Yeah, that's true. Exactly the same thing. I'm saying... Just think about the impact and the consequences that procrastination is going to have on your family. To me, that was the biggest wake-up call many, many years back when I started regularly doing these health checks. Because you just have one life and nothing is going to substitute that. You can't be replaced, you know, for your family and all. There's no replacement. So just think about that, you know. Think about your parents. I know of so many young, young men and women who've lost their lives. And today I see their parents really, I mean, not having that closure, not, you know, having... Nobody for support. I think that's a very a sad state to be in for the family. I think in addition to the loss of life, it's also the additional economic burden on the family. So when we diagnose something very late, there may still be treatments available and you and your family want to give everything a shot before uh, saying this is it, we've tried everything. Yeah. And that costs a lot of money. Well, it costs and an a lot leg. of stress. Yeah. Yeah. So in addition to, you know, God forbid, the loss of life, it's also this additional economic and uh, stress burden that you're adding to the people around you. Is it true, doctor, because I was reading about these blue zones um, around the world where people live into the hundreds. Yes. Yeah. And Japan is one of those areas. Yes. And apparently Japan started the system of screening early, catching diseases early. So you know, we, we pride ourselves at Ayurveda and the ancient texts and all of that stuff. But we're living so modern today. What is it that we need to do? Or what does the population need to do in terms of lowering their medical cost? What are the, some of the small things that they could start doing? I think uh, what's in each of our hands is, I'm going to say first, um, really evaluate your lifestyle habits. And these are around 
what you consume, right? So and that's the diet. Food, uh, water, how much alcohol, drugs. So everything you consume. Second is how much you move. So it's not just about fitness, strength. That's important. It's also about how much you keep moving through the day. Climb the stairs versus taking the elevator. Walk to get your coffee versus expecting it to show up at your desk. Take a walking meeting with somebody or a standing meeting with a group of people rather than continuously sitting. The third is sleep. Sleep enough, but also watch the quality of your sleep to make sure that it is restful for you because that's when your body actually rejuvenates um, and your brain has enough time to process everything that it's collated through the day. The fourth is stress management. The problem with stress is that the levels of cortisol and adrenaline hormones that go up, it's actually a good thing when it is in very short bursts and helps us focus and be attentive and actually perform much better. When it is sustained over a long period of time, that's called chronic stress, then the body doesn't even have a chance to get it back to normal levels. And that triggers a whole bunch of downstream pathways in your body, causing everything from indigestion to diabetes, cardiovascular issues, and so forth. And the last piece is actually a community. People that you actually mindfully engage with in different parts of your life. So this, you know, balance across different aspects of your lifestyle is, I think, what we have in our own hands and can do. In addition to this, I think there is screening, right, Manish? Absolutely. I think screening and screen time. Make screening an annual ritual for, you, for yourself. And not just yourself, the whole family. I think because, you know, ill health affects the whole family, that's one. And... You know, screen time, you know, please cut down on that. And last but not least, and it's an important point, what she alluded to is build meaningful relationships. Today, I feel that taking a backseat a lot of time. You know, the the diet, the moving and the sleep, I think a lot of people are doing that yeah. even in today's generation. Yeah. But this relationship with community, you sit on a bus, you sit on a train, you sit on a flight, everyone's in their phone. Yeah. We're no longer fostering even unknown conversations mm -hmm. and when families go out to restaurants everyone's in their phone True. Yes. so I think my takeaway point right now would be that but Dr. Manish to take further on your screening at Apollo Preventive Healthcare I understand that you're using our AI to do a lot of the screening I like to send some of my celebrity clients there I like to send the young clients over there because they would be able to get these services so what is the gamut that somebody can expect? And what are we screening? And how early can we capture something? Like if you can give me an example, like, oh, I know my grandfather had diabetes. So, or, or something even more life-threatening, as you said, the incidences of cancer are going up. Oh, I have XYZ cancer. So, can this AI screening really give us um, more value for this real yeah. estate that I own? So, um, you know, we recently launched our uh, AI-enabled precision oncology centers um, and we launched them, I mean, two of them in Bangalore. And the biggest USP for those oncology centers is AI-enabled diagnosis. So one is a faster diagnosis and a more accurate diagnosis. Because of the huge repository of data that we've built, Apollo Cancer Centers have built over the last 40-odd years, it has given us the capacity um, to diagnose even rare cancers faster and, you know, more accurately. So that's one. Even in the realm of cardiovascular diseases, our AI-enabled engine has uh, the, the predictive, um, you know, um, algorithm to diagnose cardiovascular diseases faster and better. So these are the two immediate examples that come to my mind. I think, you know, coincidentally, cardiovascular disease and cancer are the two most prevalent NCDs in India. And if Apollo Preventive Healthcare Program can do something, to mitigate that, I think it'll be a great gift to the nation. Awesome. So um, the, the cardiac risk score, cardiac? The, the AI cardiovascular disease risk score yeah. um, that we've built, 
um, actually has taken the longitudinal journeys of people who've come to Apollo over many years. Can I, say, I, can I say that is like my report card from 1st standard to 10th standard? That's right. Uh, that's right. Of all of the patients. All the patients. Of, of, of a large cohort, cohort of, of people. Patients. Right? But why would you want to know everybody? Yeah, so a large cohort. But why? What yes. is the purpose? So, basically we then know if somebody came in with certain types of indicators early, oh. what does that mean for that kind of person five years out, ten years out? And we've taken about 21 different contributors to the heart attack and figured out through an AI algorithm what is the combination that for this person, right? what is the path that they are on? Right? You said we throw the ball, we know where it will land. This is exactly what the cardiac risk score algorithm does today. Based on your current state, which includes your family history, unmodifiable risk factor, and all your current lifestyle, as well as your current health state, we then are able to predict your chance of having a heart event within 10 years. Within 10 years? Within 10 years. And if a 25-year-old walked in, you could still tell them that you probably are a candidate for a heart attack by 35? That's right. So let me tell you the scarier statistic. When we looked at 30 to 50-year-olds, mm -hmm who came in and then we applied the cardiac risk score on them after it was developed, one in two of them, right? So 50% off of them Whoa. have a moderate or high risk of having a cardiac event within the next 10 years. So if I'm screening, one is you're putting the fear of God in me in terms of I'm one out of two that could have the heart attack. And so now you're telling me that information and then you're asking me to change my sleep, my diet, my lifestyle right. and my community. Ryan, we need the wake-up call, right? I think we have all realized that without that, we are going to coast in life. Anything, what anything. Do mean, what do you mean by coast in life? Do the same things that we are used to without necessarily changing the path. Yeah? And preventive healthcare is saying, let me use the screening and figure out what's your pathway. And if there's a roadblock ahead, you could take a detour. Detour? Right, so that you're able to Avoid ensure that. that, yeah, and go ahead on a different path. And I'd just like to add one point here. I think it's today the market is crowded with a lot of health check packages being offered by, you know, everybody. Yeah, there are so many health, so many health yeah. packages. So if I walk into Apollo Healthcare, what what's what am I looking for? Or what am I? What are the first things I need to do? So one is, of course, as I said, we've simplified. Earlier, you know, we used to have a plethora of health package. We've simplified now. We have age-specific for men and women. That's it. So if you're a 30-year-old male, you have a whole body test which has already been customized for you. You don't need to kind of look through the whole maze of tests. So we've kind of simplified it. And then with this AI enablement, you can be assured of a faster and more accurate diagnosis. Third, the point I was trying to make was that today, everybody in the market is offering multiple health packages. It's very important to discern and be very careful in which hospital we go to. You know, I think it's important to trust a very credible institution because it's your life that you're screening, I mean, that you're entrusting them with. So rather than choosing the most economical or the most convenient health screening package, it's important to do that with the most credible health partner. That you know, So do some research. You know, you know, you have these X, Y, Zs selling packages at thousand rupees and all. I think we are we we shouldn't take that very very lightly. It's better to kind of pay a premium but get yourself screened at the best center uh, with some research. I think the additional way we've incorporated AI into ProHealth, which is Apollo's health check program, is uh, we are able to today personalize a package if you choose to based on your risks, right? So some people want a thali, right? And we've simplified the thali to be able to easily pick yeah. and select. Others say, no, no, I have gluten allergy, lactose intolerance. I actually want to go a la carte. But how do I pick a la carte? I'm not an expert as a layperson. 
And what we've therefore done is sat with our doctors with years of their clinical expertise, put together an engine that can predict based on simply 10 questions that you answer what you are at risk for and therefore what you should be tested for. Wow. I'm already thinking how, to, how do I get to the nearest Apollo Health Checkup and get it done. Okay, so let's get more people tested in this country. Right. That's going to be our mission and vision. Get more people screened, get more people tested. We are a very large country. 1.3 billion plus people. I'm sure there's a lot of statistical variation. North India, South India, this is huge dietary difference, uh, height difference, pollution, body type difference, <laughs> pollution difference. Uh, are there any data coming up to you guys that says that people from South India should uh, run faster for a testing, people from North India should run faster? For the, give us some insights. So there was a recent report um, I read uh, which was conducted across several states in, in India. Uh, you know, if I look at diabetes, for example, South and North are actually equally predisposed. Although central and northeastern parts of the country have less incidence of diabetes. It's also an urban phenomenon. So, right, urban population has more diabetes incidence than rural population. But interestingly, pre-diabetes is actually the, the number is much higher than the diabetic population, which is a very dangerous thing. Doctor, for the uninitiated yeah, right there, right. when everyone says diabetes, 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 right. can you, in a layman term, explain what is diabetes and then what yeah. is pre-diabetes? Yeah, so diabetes is a condition where the body's ability to produce insulin is compromised. Insulin is produced from uh, pancreas. And when there are cells in pancreas that become non-functional, the insulin quantity reduces and our body's ability to process glucose diminishes and hence you have high blood sugar. And once that blood sugar touches a certain threshold or remains beyond a threshold consistently, that's when we call uh, you know, it a diabetic condition. So, And then the pre-diabetic? Pre-diabetes is the stage which is Oh, I'm going to get I'm going to get diabetes. So the AI is saying you're going to go down that path. That's right. We have a pre-diabetes risk score. Risk. Because once you have diabetes, there's no point in any AI predicting anything in the future. You have it. You have it. But the pre-diabetes risk score tells you, based again on your family history, your predisposition, as well as your lifestyle choices, what is your risk of getting pre-diabetes, which is your glycosylated hemoglobin or HbA1c, A1C. between 5.8 and 6.4. So everyone, if you're out here in South India, let's all get tested pre-diabetic because we're eating too much of carbohydrates or rice and our sugar levels have gone up. But what about North India? I think South India overall has a slightly marginally higher risk for NCDs overall. But I think diabetes and hypertension are, I would say, uniformly equally, equally, equally distributed. Only the central part of India and northeastern part of India were, had less incidence of these two conditions. Among genders... Men have a higher uh, predisposition for you know high cholesterol level than women, uh, so that was the other finding. But in all of this, I would say the biggest alarming finding has been the rising incidence of pre-diabetes across urban and rural areas. So that you know, I think the, today, for example, we have 98 million diabetics in the country. We are the diabetic capital, which right? is 17 percent of all overall diabetics globally. And I think we love our food and we love our sweets. And also that the fact that we have this propensity. Exactly. Genetic propensity, pre propensity as a population. population. You made something very keen because my father-in-law is an orthopedic surgeon. He's 78 years old and he loves, he's from Orissa, and he loves his mishti doi and raskulas and all. And he eats more sugar than I do. Right. And he has an HbA1c score of 5.2. So you mentioned something from that part of India. People have a... Diabetic resistant gene or something? They, I mean, they have less propensity. Less propensity, propensity for diabetes. I, I'm just thinking. And I'm I, sure he's quite active, isn't he? Yeah, he's very active. But I'm just thinking if we could just get that gene, Ooh. you know, and uh, like eat our rasculas more often. But jokes I apart, wish, wish, yeah. jokes <laughs> apart, I think as a nutritionist, people are eating far more than their fathers and mothers Absolutely. and their grandfathers and grandmothers. We just did uh, a food diary with a few of our clients. I, I had the privilege of working with a family of three generations. So I would ask the grandfather and grandmother how many times you ate out. So they met out once a quarter at MTR and ate once a quarter because they didn't have that much of money. Right. 
the father and mother met out once a month. We didn't have that much money. Yeah. True. The children are in MTR every third day. <laughs> right? So, so the incidences <laughs> of external exposure and therefore when you go out, no portion control, you eat Absolutely. how much you want. Absolutely. And with the new thing, which I feel is that people are just eating more because they're stressed out. Like we work very hard uh, and that's what that grandfather said. We did a nine to five job. There was no SMS, WhatsApp or, yeah, yeah. or Zoom call at seven o'clock in the evening, which your boss got yes. to you. So you stopped your day. But your generations are working double hard, which means the brain is working so much. So when you finish your day, your life, I need a reward. Yeah. 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 Or you're not as conscious about it also because you're so distracted with so many things that are going on. I never thought about that. Right. Being distracted. Yeah. And therefore you end up just uh, consuming whatever, how much ever, without really being mindful about what's going on. And since a lot of your followers like nutrition, allow me to actually talk about my three rules around consumption. The first is reduce. Reduce. Right. Um, let's stop eating when we are 80% full. Mm. Ah, that's a nice thought. Yeah. And so reduce. The second is reorder. Proteins and vegetables and fruits first. And then carbohydrates. Oh, I thought you meant reorder as an a waiter. Get me another order. <laughs> I was like, this doctor is really cool. Okay. Reorder means change the... Order, order. in which you are consuming. Consuming, yeah. That's right. And so say that again. Protein first and pro vegetables. Protein and fruits ve and vegetables. Vegetables first. E first. Then carbohydrates. So for example, in our home, the proteins come out to the table first, get served first. Mm. Salads, fruits and vegetables, even if in a cooked form, get served first. So while it's first on your table, even if you're mindless about it, you're, that's what you're consuming first. Yeah. And you get a little bit full and then come the carbs onto your plate, right? And so reorder. And the third is replace. Hmm. Where you can find a way to replace the processed foods that we are used to these days with a little bit more traditional foods like some of your millets or uh, brown rice, brown sugar, jaggery and so forth in reduced quantities, right? So allows us to then replace some of the ingredients in what we cook for an overall balanced meal, but it's still the kind of food that we eat every day at home without putting pressure on the kitchen. Yeah. So I just wanted to add, I mean, you know, and you would probably, I mean, you're the expert. Is that Dean Nash's diet? What have I yeah. got the name? Did I get the, the name Dean right? Ornish diet. Dean yeah. Ornish diet, yeah. right? That actually changing your dietary habits can reverse aging and reverse many of these conditions, isn't that? That's so, right. I, as as a celebrity nutritionist, I make a lot of money doing that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, <That's the> job. <laughs> so, I meant it's just not this. I mean, screening is a big part of yes. it. But I think diet and change in modification, right? I think going forward is going to be, if, play a if, big role. If doctor, I can speak very candidly from a nutritionist or a doctor. The screening gives you the wake up call. call. Yes. To wake up and smell the roses that you have only one body. Absolutely. And this body cannot be replaced like your mobile phone, laptop, house, and even spouse. In fact, one day I had an argument with my wife. I said, my body is my life partner. She says, what do you mean to say? I'm your life partner. <laughs> I'm like, look, dude, I had to get out of bed to get married to you. The body went and got married to you. <laughs> Trust Very me. true. Bo yes. Our body should be our first Us. love. Yes. yes. And so I told her this. I, my wife is not hearing this. Yeah, I, no, you, you, like, me, like me, I slept in the next bedroom for the next <laughs> one week. Yeah, you sleep with your life partner. Yeah. But, but at the end of the day, um, you know, when we do these screenings, yeah. I have seen an instant disciplinary modification by my client. The reason being is, I'll give you an example. Oh, Dean Ornish told me to eat this diet plan. Ryan Fernando told me to eat this diet plan. Mm. But if your AI heart screening says you are predisposition to diabetes or heart attack in so many days, then the person sitting down in the counseling room and saying, what do I need to change? Yes. It's the trigger for change. It's the yes. behavioral modification yes. for change. And I think over a period of time, if genetic screening were to become cheaper and mandatory in some form or shape, that would actually lead to a you know, revolution, so to speak. And That's also true. these exercise variables that we are yeah. using yeah. Uh, gives another data set point. And um, I think people are shying away from the fact that they can take control of their life. Yeah. But speaking of control, uh, we all work, right? 
and we all work and we have this 9 to 5 you have to report in you're here today on my podcast only 9 to 5 ryan what kind of job do you do oh, i have a 9 to 5 job <laughs> i am doing my, i'm doing my diet my sleep and my work hours correctly <laughs> but the fact of the matter is here's this okay i believe corporates can do lot more for their employees how do you think a polo preventive healthcare can be embedded and do you feel doctor that it has a productivity impact on an employee so um let me start with first apollo's own example yeah right our chair what chairman, do you mean by apollo's own example yeah. so our uh, chairman pratap reddy uh is exceptionally passionate about preventive health he in fact started the master health screening in 1974 in india i was not even born then <laughs> wow that that early on you know he's he the pioneer of pioneer of preventive you know, health, health checks in the country ah okay and he's constantly pushing us to evolve um about 5 6 years ago he said listen as corporates we actually our biggest asset are our employees and we apollo are in the healthcare sector we need to lead the way uh for all corporates so all of the employees at apollo will get their uh, pro health done um at the expense of the company one year goes by two year goes by a few people here and there who have triggers in their personal life went and did it um but not everybody we many many people avoided it like the general public today and then one year he said we will not be doing performance appraisals if you do not complete your health check by march 31 and that the applied to doc- doctors, doctors as well. as well doctors as well you're kidding me doctors uh, were not doing the preventive health screening not all of them and he made it but there were them as well yes yeah. and the bhag dor yeah, that yeah. year was madness right I know, I know, it a is madness crazy. because Some, yeah. sometimes you need a parent to take care of you yes mm. but here's the beauty of it after that that year mm. you don't have to repeat that statement ever again it became a habit Every year now we just get people coming because we then give a reminder and then they said ah oh. and then the I guess the trauma of that year um they come and they do it I think more and more and more corporates need to um uh, take this on right and do this for their employees but now that we have at a large cohort level multiple years of having done this Ryan what we are seeing in terms of the reduction in the unmanaged diabetes unmanaged cholesterol levels and most important the decline in obesity right it's it's staggering so we now have the data to be able to see at an aggregate level of a cause is hypertension also part yes. of this because i'm yes, assuming there's a lot of stress yes it is and it's also coming down yes, yes. as a lot of stress that's also coming down because see once you're diagnosed with it you manage it yeah. but if you know you have a propensity and you learn to manage it and ultimately it comes down to what you consume how much you move how you sleep and how you manage your stress right and so we'll talk a little bit about pro health and how we are incorporating some of the follow ups and not just to be able to do that but staying with your your founder dr reddy and uh, doing this in 1974 i get called in to do a lot of events and speak about it when the leader leads the organization from the value of the employee and the value is not only from a perspective of productivity but the essence of a person then healthcare becomes crucially and truly important yes. where am i going with the statement i had a billionaire client who instructed his hr to set up healthcare preventive in the organization but many times and this goes out to the rest of india many times hr is truly focused on the bottom line truly focused on only holidays and truly only focused on attendance marking and how we can get more out of people and if apollo as an organization in itself led by a doctor who's a leader insists that everyone gets their health checkup yeah. done yeah. and puts a diktat to it yes. and i think the word over there is diktat because i remember once sitting as a nutritionist I asked myself when I run my own organization today as this as the head of my organization as a founder do I invade my employees privacy 
or am I actually being the crystal ball astrologer and saying I want to take care of you? So I send a message back to your founder. Kudos to what he's done for all the people at Polo, and I think every organization out there needs to have a leader that puts a boot silently up everyone saying that you need to get your health care checkup done. So, speaking of offices, can we do these pro health checkups in offices? Absolutely. I think um, in in our conversations with uh, corporates and companies, what we realize is uh, even if they have a set of offerings, right, and uh, pro health checks for their employees, very few actually take it up. Anywhere from 10 to 30 percent of employees actually uh, go to a center and uh, avail a pro health. And therefore, we realized we had to rethink the model because uh, employees don't want to uh, do this um, at, a, at a take the time to, to go out. It's actually quite inconvenient, especially in cities where some of the centers are very far away from their homes. So we've actually innovated on a couple of different models. Um, one is we have what is called an Apollo Health Check on Wheels. This is a mobile bus that is fitted with equipment such as a digital x-ray or a mammogram and has additional equipment that can be wheeled off. So a cardiac stress bike to make sure that we can test your heart under some endurance, um, eye screening, audiometry and so forth, along with, of course, your routine blood tests. But we wanted to make sure that what we offer to employees is actually quite comprehensive and not just simply blood tests. And so we have the fitted um, AHC on wheels or Apollo Health Checks on wheels that can then go park itself in an office complex and then be able to um, conduct the screenings at the convenience of the employees um, over a period of a few days. Another uh, innovation that we've actually worked out operationally is your health check can be broken up into a couple of different parts. The first part is we draw your blood. Let's say a phlebotomist or a nurse can come out to the office. At your desk or in a common room, you come in and they draw your blood, label your samples and ship it off to the lab. They are then able to process the reports and keep it ready. You then can book an appointment for the imaging component, your ultrasound, your mammogram, your uh, x-ray, um, ECG, echo and so forth to make sure it's a comprehensive health check in the hospital or the clinic at a time that's convenient to you. And because the blood is already drawn, the reports are ready, the doctor review can happen right away. And this can also be done at any time of the day. It could be during your lunch break, it could be in the evening, it could be on a Sunday. And you also spend less time because you're not waiting for the lab reports to get to come in. So this is another way that we've actually uh, innovated to be able to make this more rem- convenient for employees. And, you know, in the last year or so, we probably have screened about eight to 9,000 um, corporate health, uh, corporate employees uh, in their campuses through this. Um, and we, besides this, we also give them corporate health report cards. Report cards, health, I think health that's cards important, them, yeah, right? When I, when I get a report card, yes, then I, I know that I have to some steps. It's not like washed under the rug that I just got a Absolutely. blood test. Absolutely. So there's a report card at the individual level yes. yeah. um, that tells you what's going on, what needs immediate attention, And then what are some of the next steps for you to actually do? And then there is a company report card as well, right? Because if you think about the company as a community and productivity and the health of the employees is an important asset for you, then at an aggregate level, how are you doing, right? If your um, employees have much higher numbers, have hypertension than the average in in the population, then there's something for you to actually think about. Yeah, That's very interesting because uh, there's a joke over here. When we were sitting at one of the Fortune 500 companies as a nutrition clinic, so we did a small survey and we asked the employees to tick mark and one of the questions was about constipation. So about 100 employees went through the survey and about 67 of them or 68 of them ticked mark constipation. Mm -hmm. And so when the head HR saw that, she went, no wonder everyone walks through the front door with a, with a grumpy face early morning. <laughs> That's exactly right. So what you're saying to me is the health of an organization health. is truly reflected in the health of its people. Absolutely. And that's when I realized this. So 
getting a report card not only for the individual but the organization. Yes. I think every CFO should be listening in carefully about this. And then the head of HR who saw this can then choose to do something more meaningful around constipation related activities, right? Whether it's changing what they serve in the kitchen to have more fiber or talking much more about different aspects of fiber, changing the snacks in the kitchen for more fiber and allows them to focus some of the well-being programs around things that actually matter rather than just the generic well-being program. So we talked about the adults and the office space and I'm sure there are a lot of mothers out there who are also working and the first question that any mother asks is about her children. Yes. So are there any actionable sets of things that people can do? What can a doctor give an advice for children out there for this I don't know if I can call it a pandemic of oncoming diabetes, hypertension and non-communicable diseases. So what should parents do with their children or what, what should we do? So at Apollo, what we found, Ryan, is that um, three out of five children today, especially in urban and privileged schools, are obese. Three out of five? Overweight or obese. Wow. Yeah. And that essentially is setting the stage for a very young adulthood that could have many of these NCDs much, much earlier. Much earlier. Um, so we are going to be the youngest 1.3 billion population, but also have the highest amount of uh, these lifestyle diseases. Unless we do something about it now. And screening is one of them and changing the behavior of the younger kids. Absolutely. Sorry, so what, what is the next part of this so three out of five? we actually did uh, with ProHealth at Apollo is to actually think about from a pediatric perspective, right? What do you need to know about a child at five or six years old when they're ready to go to school? Is their eyesight okay? Do they have any sort of attention-related conditions, right, that you need to be watching out for? Uh, adolescence, hormones kick in, very different kinds of behaviors. What are we doing to actually make sure we're screening for some of those issues, right? Girl hits puberty. Do we have enough iron in the diet, right? What are some of the hormones doing to their body? What are some of the um, high-risk behaviors that teenagers are getting into? So we've actually thought about different stages of childhood, if you will, um, and then said, what should we be screening for based on what the pediatrician is picking up? So the first thing is make sure you do go see the pediatrician. Early ages will be all about vaccinations, but then around five, six, then let's add uh, a little bit around what uh, they need to be ready for school. Um, subsequent years after five till 10, you actually lose touch with the pediatrician. True. Yeah. And then you come back for a couple of vaccinations and you're on the cusp of puberty. So the pediatrician has another opportunity. And then what? After that, tell me when you go to a doctor next. Only, only when, you're when, when you have a symptom or you're sick. Right, But I think having uh, some touch and engagement with your pediatrician, at least until you're 16, allows them a window into figuring out if there's anything going on. And it could be something as simple as um, when suddenly uh, boys grow taller at a particular age, their body's physiology right, uh, is not keeping up yet with the shooting up and the height. And therefore, they may have some dizziness. And so it's little things like that that parents don't have to stress about, but if they know in advance. And the best person to get some of that advice from is actually an expert doctor, a pediatrician in this case. So as parents, if you can't get through to your children directly, find a way to engage with through your pediatrician on a regular basis. And, you know, to just drive on that point, we have a whole vertical dedicated for uh, kids called Apollo Children's. I mean, it's a whole vertical and not just looking after acute care or chronic care, but also wellness um, as part of this vertical. Just to kind of focus more on this this age group, uh, which needs attention in multiple forms. I think most of us as parents, we kind of like hear a hospital's name and think, uh, oh, if I take my kid over there, the kid is sick. Mm. Uh, it's a place of pain. But actually, we need to rethink preventive health care, yeah. even for our children. Yeah. Because I am at the nutrition clinic doing a lot of sports kits. Mm -hmm. And in these sports kits, we ask for a blood test because I am going to give them a protein powder, yes. 
a sports drink, a multivitamin. And I'm like, look, I don't want to give you a product. I know you're playing four hours of tennis a day, six hours of tennis a day, or six hours of golf a day. But I know that I can't give you this stuff unless I know there is a nutritional deficiency. Mm -hmm. Let's do a blood test. And lo and behold, when we do a blood test on a 9, 10, 12, 15 year old, 16 year old, we have high cholesterol. Yes. Yes. We have uric acid. Yes. Right? Yes. And that's scary. Yeah, and I think some somewhere parents also have to share some part of that blame. Because you made that point early on also. We are consuming more than we need. And that's true for kids. I mean, obesity is on a rise. And I'm not surprised with these cholesterol levels and sugar levels on the rise as well. You know, screen time, look at screen time, look at the kind of processed food they're consuming. I think it's extremely unusual and I'll not be surprised. And that kind of ties into a point about pre-diabetics on the rise. So it's all a chain. And somewhere I think parents also have to share that responsibility and be, be strict with their kids. See, in the modern day conveniences that liberalization of the country brought is huge, right? I mean, we are all living it and enjoying it. But along with that came the bane of some of these lifestyle diseases. We have the advantage of seeing what it's done to the West. Let's learn from it and not make the same mistakes and wait as long. Yeah, that, those are wise words. You know, we touched about children and the office space and somewhere in our conversation, Dr. Manish, you said that one of the biggest post-pandemic targets on people's back was cancer, the big C. Right. Now, are there any specific types of cancer that you are seeing at Apollo Healthcare on the rise? Uh, and what age group are you seeing it? And somebody watching in, if they're in that age profile, what are you telling a person in their 30s to 40s, 40s to 50s, 50s to 60s, 60 to 70? Are they watching out for anything from a cancer screening point of view? So cancer screening, I think as the incidence has picked up, so has screening. So uh, yeah. for the layman and me also, yeah. what do you mean by cancer screening? I'm going to go in and you're going to stick a needle in me or what are the basic things that you do when you so, do a cancer screening? You know, for females, for example, um, get a be breast screening done, whether it's an ultrasound or a mammogram. And there are guidelines for it, you know. And then um, get a pap smear done you know, annually, and then a colonoscopy every 10 years, say, after 50 years. women also? Yes. Yes. Yes, oh. because... Okay. I thought only men get uh, uh, colon cancer. I okay. mean, the incidence is higher, but, you know, colon cancer is on the rise in the country across genders. Uh, so these are, and for men, of course, oral examination, prostate, uh, and colonoscopy, as I said. Uh, because among men, lung cancer, prostate cancer, cancer of the stomach, esophagus, head and neck cancers are on the rise. Uh, highest incidence and on, in females, cervical, breast and lung cancers in that order. And these cancer screenings that you're doing, you're also having the genetic screening done? Because I'm asking this question from a perspective, can I blame my grandfather and grandparents or is this environment that is causing my cancer now? So Ryan, there's an expiry date for blaming your parents. <laughs> right? <laughs> There's yeah. an expiry date for blaming your parents. I'm assuming <laughs> I'm assuming it's the day you say bye bye mama papa and you leave the house. <laughs> I I think it's somewhere in your early 20s <laughs> where you start to truly take charge yeah. um and own your life. Yeah. I think um the uh, challenge I have is that blood tests almost never catch the cancers until much, much, much too late. True. In some cases, not at all, unless it is blood cancer. Um, imaging, radiology scans, chest x-ray, low-dose CT, whole body MRIs, um, mammograms, ultrasounds, colonoscopies. This is what catches the cancers early. And therefore, making sure that based on your age and family history, that is anyone close to you who you may know has had a cancer, please then regularly screen yourselves. And regularly means at least once a year? Once a year, yes, yes. for some, right? Like he said, colonoscopy you need once in 10 years. 10 years, yeah. Pap smear you need once in three years, as long as you're clear. So there are guidelines. And this is what also feeds into our personalization engine. Mm. as well. So if I have a family history of breast cancer on the maternal side, my chance of breast cancer is very high. 
and therefore i better start scanning at 35 every year but if i don't have that i still am a, a woman greater than 40 have a chance of getting breast cancer um please screen at least every other year for sure after 40 in our data at Apollo, we found that 25% of women who were diagnosed with breast cancer were less than 40. Wow, that's a that's a heartbreaking statistic. Yes. Why? So the so it's all the more reason if you're younger than 40 as a female to get tested, yes. just to rule out that you're not one of those 25%. And early detection, I think, is one of the best things a person can do in cancer, right? Yeah, and you know, that's one. And I'll tell you the reason also. Because it's been found, uh, you know, a study was done in UK uh, by National Cancer Registration and Analysis Service that the more severe form of cancer, um, you know, it, it is, the less the presentation, the typical symptoms are lesser and difficult to diagnose. For example, you know, brain tumor, for example, will present with head, head headache and nausea and all, which we can mistake for any other, you know, minor ailment. Uh, indigestion can can be a symptom of stomach cancer, but we don't take it seriously. Pancreatic cancer, the symptoms are very atypical, non-typical, and perhaps can be ignored, but that's the warning sign. Unless you get yourself screened every year, there's no way of knowing. And by the time they present in far more severe form, it's already too late. Wow. You know, speaking of too late, moving from the big C to, yes, we're screening people, people are getting more healthier. There's the other end of the spectrum where people are getting too healthy. The gym goers, <laughs> the gym buffs, body transformation. Oh, yes. I am fit. Oh, yes. six, six, packs. six packs. I can run 32 kilometers after yeah. starting yesterday oh, yes. morning. Right? So we have a lot of these flag bearers mm. uh, because in school they played for the Ranji team or they were on the volleyball team or they were on the swim team. And like, yeah, I'm so fit and I've watched all these podcasts and Fit India programs and all of these influencers and all. And then suddenly you see a lot of people dropping dead yeah. from heart attacks in yeah. gyms, you know, in uh, marathon runners. Um, so are we confusing ourselves with fit body and healthy body? Doctor, what's your take on this? Because when you're doing screening, you're like the referee over there. Mm. You're refereeing. And you can see everyone on the playing field. And you see this fit buff person who hasn't done screening. And then you see this average Charlie who's done the screening. So fit body or healthy body. What's your take on this? Yeah. So especially gym goers, marathon runners, the organ for us to focus on here is the heart. Yeah. And the most common um, condition of the heart that we've all heard about is the heart attack that is caused by a clock. And that is a result of many years of plaque deposit inside our arteries that hardens, breaks off, and a clot will go and block a blood vessel. And then that area will not be able to get oxygen from the blood. And hence, it ends up being a problem. When that blood vessel is actually in the heart, right? it causes a heart attack. That's the most common thing that we've all heard of and that comes from years of unfit lifestyle and diet and lack of uh, activity and so forth. However, uh, the heart is actually an amazing organ. It uh, requires electrical impulses at a regular frequency for it to beat. It also requires muscles to be able to pump the blood enough so that it reaches the tippy toe and the corner of your brain. When you put the heart under stress, while your arteries may be clean because you're eating very well and you're extremely active, it may actually come in the way of the electrical activity and the pumping activity. And that's what sudden cardiac death or people suddenly dropping dead actually comes from. So, Doctor, I'm just thinking about everybody who watches my podcast. At some point, they want to work out. Uh, oh, you're talking about health screening. Oh, you're talking about exercise. Oh, you're talking about diet. 
I'm going to start exercising. And everyone goes into fourth gear suddenly. <laughs> Is there any test that they can do at Apollo Healthcare, preventive healthcare, that will give them some sort of indication that by go slow or go all out? Is is there anything that we can discover? There is Apollo uh, Pro Health heart screening package. If you ask me, for somebody who is interested in doing this, that's actually a short, short test to know whether you are fit enough to take take up these rig- vigorous physical exercises. So you will get patients that you will have to tell them go easy, go slow. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the and results, they look young. Ab- oh yeah, many of them. I mean, we've had patients in their Arrhythmia early early twenties yeah. coming in. Uh, with with an ischemia, with you know, with a, with a heart. So heart a, arrhythmia means what? Irregular heart. Irregular, irregular heartbeat. heartbeat. Is this inherited or this is a lifestyle? Because I'm asking this question: mm-hmm. if I if I had arrhythmia, oh, where did I get it? Do I look at my parents or do I look at my diet? I think it could be both. Okay. Arrhythmia could be a result of a lesion that you have in your heart because of a previous heart attack. So it could be linked to your history or your lifestyle. And these either. conditions are uh, maintainable, reversible, uh, or every condition manageable. Is I would say manageable. manageable is the word. Yes, I think reversible is uh, used too loosely today. Yeah, everyone wants damage to is done. Yeah, it depends on how much damage, no? Yes. Right. So uh, if if a home is damaged, slight damage we can fix. And correct, and it will look as good as new, and even feel, and maybe it's. Or if you maintain your house very well, very well, then it doesn't doesn't get damaged that often. But if the foundation is off, mm. and the damage has been there for twenty years, and you didn't even know, because you didn't get screened, and it showed up as a symptom, then I don't think reversible is possible. What you can do is manage. Manage. And I also want to come in that point of marathoners, you know, having these sudden cardiac arrests and all. I think it's important to get the underlying heart condition checked, which has been aggravated by, you know, a symptom called, I mean, a syndrome called long COVID, the long-term effects of COVID, which we are seeing across um, genders, across age groups and all. So I think the propensity of people to have these issues post-COVID has increased. Uh, cholest- high, high cholesterol level, diabetes incidence, hypertension, and so on and so forth. So we have to be very, very mindful. Coupled with the fact that many of these, um, you know, victims have had vigorous fig- physical exercise and an undetected underlying condition, that's led to these incidents that we have seen in the past. And I think the other uh, realization is also that our body is very interconnected. It's not like one organ is individual yeah, another. Yeah, of course. Right? And so when um, when you have such r- vigorous activity, the lung and the heart have to be in such sync okay. mm-hmm. with one another. So a VO2 max test w- along with a treadmill allows us to see under the conditions of such endurance and stress, how does your heart and lung perform together and therefore are you ready? Otherwise, an ECG echo and TMT, treadmill test, this combination can actually tell you what your current heart condition is. An ECG will detect the heartbeat and the electrical activity. The echo is about the pumping and the treadmill test is about placing the heart under a little bit of stress increasingly and seeing how you respond and how the um, ECG, the pumping as well as the electrical activity responds in that context. So let's not mistake a fit body for a healthy body. That's the mistake people are making very commonly these days. Yeah, and I think because of lack of time, everyone's trying to get this uh, instant body, mm. instant yes. result, instant health. And so even when they're doing their fitness, they're doing this instant fitness, and that instant fitness is actually a very high level of expert fitness. Yeah, And I think also we have to caution the workout industry right yeah absolutely the trainer is given a certain pressure sure. to deliver sure a certain results. result very quickly and i think the the sports trainer the athletic trainers the physio trainers have to work with the industry and their client and say like slow and steady wins the race you know and uh, do you do anything like a body fat percentage yes. test yes so we actually do the body fat composition analyzer Right, which actually gives you a sense for 
uh, not just BMI, right? That's okay, an easy metric that many people know, the body mass index. But I think um, how much visceral fat do you have? And that means how much of your fat around the abdominal organs, right? Around your organs do you have? That's actually far worse than what I'm going to call the total fat or in your periphery, right? So it's okay to carry a little bit of fat in your thighs and your hips and your buttocks, right? But not so much in your abdominal region. Um, it also gives you a sense for your basal metabolic rate, which means when you're at a resting state, typically sleeping, what is the metabolic rate of your body at that time? The challenge with sitting without moving for 30 to 45 minutes is that our body thinks we are in a little bit of a resting state and the basal metabolic rate drops to as if you were sleeping. That means when you reach out and have that sugar cookie and drink that chai with... Oh, it's two, going to the liver. It's going to the liver, exactly. And it's not metabolizing it even as well as it should. And so the body composition analyzer allows us much more insight into what to do next. You know why I asked this question? Because everyone joins the gym or goes marathon running to lose the fat that they gained over 20 years <laughs> from college into their first job, second job, shadi, yes. having two kids. And then they need to lose it fast. Yes. But they don't know that to burn one kg of fat requires slow walking of two hours every day for one month. Because Interesting. you have to be in that fat burn zone, so, mm. right? Not running, that puts you in a cardiac zone, which is great for your cardio, but not doesn't burn your fat as easily. You've heard it there first from the doctor. Fat burning, and I have been, always been saying this, I told even Amir Khan in his Dangal movie role, he has to walk 38,000 steps to lose fat. You have to walk to lose fat. You don't need a fit body running like Usain Bolt or Kenneth Bednarik. You need to walk and have patience to get to that goal and always do a health screening. Now, when you're speaking of screening, we've got the fit body, 80% of gymming audience in India is male. What about the female? Yeah. I know we talked a little bit about breast cancer screening and all, but quickly, what are the bang, 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 bang scans that a woman has to do? Because most women I meet, they're always in a hurry, managing the home, managing the family, managing everything, right? So they're like, they don't have time to do lots of stuff. So quickly, what should a woman do for all her screenings? Um, definitely a DEXA scan. DEXA scan, what's that? Bone density as well as muscle. Bone muscle. density and muscle. Um, heart after menopause. Heart after menopause. Because your hormones actually protect you, estrogen and so forth, before menopause. Um, the mammograms we talked about, pap smears, cervical cancer, as early as possible. And if you're really young, then please get the vaccination, HPV vaccine far more protective and my generation didn't have it. I think the only other one I will actually highlight here is uh, cognitive screening. Cognitive screening. And that means figuring out your brain function. And the reason I say this is uh, we're seeing also that perhaps because of the many, many priorities we juggle and hold on to the stress, there is a slowdown of the brain function much later in life, manifesting as memory losses, dementias, and so forth. And so please find a way to do some cognitive screening. Husbands, if you heard this in, this is what you need to do. Don't get angry at your wife. Take her to Apollo Healthcare and get a screening done because Dr. Satya said so, not you. <laughs> so... This one part that I want to ask, because I get a lot of young athletes, and I don't know if this is relevant to preventive healthcare screening, but all the female athletes I work with from the age of 12, their first menstruation cycle, till maybe even their marriage, they have never met a gynecologist. Doctor, how important is it for a young female girl, a young lady, Yes to go and meet a gynecologist, even if nothing is wrong? Um, so it's a great question, Ryan. I think, firstly, definitely meet the pediatrician. 
pediatrician. Yes, because the pediatrician is trained up around multiple facets, including the puberty, right? And sort of what I'm going to call early fertility period. Um, so that means when the girl first gets her menstruation cycle, the pediatrician is a great person to have a touch base with. Absolutely. Because it, the pediatrician all then can decide if there is anything that we should be watching for. Allows the pediatrician to educate the parent yeah. and the girl child to be aware. We have a lot of teenage weight gain nowadays yes. in the female athlete. Yes. So uh, is that towards the PCOD condition? So uh, the polycystic ovary um, syndrome is actually on the rise and impacting fertility. Are we testing this in a preventive healthcare setup? So the way we would test for this is um, through hormones and the hormone panel. And we absolutely do it. Thyroid typically comes up as the number one. So we have thyroid stimulating hormone test um, included in our women panels. Um, we also make sure that if someone is overweight or obese, then we throw in a hormonal panel. Um, and then there is questions around your menstrual cycle. I think it's very important for women to find a way to make note and understand any patterns or trends that they're seeing. There are apps on the phone. We are married to our phones. Um, and enough of this is available. And if not, go old-fashioned. Calendar in you know either the digital format or noted down. So if a woman's cycle is 28 to 30 days, she's good. But if it's skipping or missing, yes. then maybe pick up the phone and talk to a guy. And an in-between spotting. That's another one. Okay, so in between spotting, ladies, please watch for that. And we're talking about the youngsters. Yes. Many of them will go and meet a gynecologist after marriage for birth control or for fertility. But I am seeing girls in much younger ages not doing this. So you could get yourself screened with a good gynecologist. Now, we move into the part where not only girls and boys, but everyone at all age has this stress problem. Mm. Now, I don't know whether preventive healthcare screening um, throws light on this but obviously you have all of this data and screening all of these people we know we need to get screened yes. that's that's a given right now some tips from Dr. Satya in terms of stress and sleep oh, how important are these two are they married to each other and are there any insights you would like to share with our audience so um, stress and sleep are uh collaborate with one another and also then cause a number of physical changes that lead to the downstream non-communicable diseases we've been talking about. Um, I am going to go straight to the hacks and the tips, um, Ryan. I think uh, when it comes to stress, I think uh, it's a very, very important to find a way to declutter your brain. Every day, we get about 23 to 25 GB worth of information that our brain has to process. Wow. Right? So think about your computers and when it crashes and the hard disk, essentially stress levels are related to how much processing you're doing and not allowing your brain to figure out what's important to keep, what to discard, and what to not worry about. So decluttering is important. And that comes in a number of different ways. It could be taking a very, very short mini break to a place that is away from a city so that you just have less visual stimulation. It could be locking yourself up and just reading a book with nobody around you because then you're focused only on one thing, the words on the page. It could be uh, doing yoga and uh, staying through the Shavasana because it's really important part of decluttering your brain. And it could be ensuring that you actually get enough and good quality sleep. I think sleep in at least our research findings for people who come um, to Apollo, we find is correlated with diabetes and hypertension. And the risk of that goes up. So we've incorporated sleep screening and stress screening as part of ProHealth as well. And there are so many different ways. We all hear it from so many influencers don't look at the blue light, turn off your TV one hour before sleeping. But guess what? That's also the time we want to binge watch and use our Netflix and Amazon Prime accounts, right? 
Um, so we may need to figure out, okay, after that binge watching, can I do a 15 minute meditation app that allows me to go, uh, calm down and sleep? Um, is it a Epsom salt soak while I'm binge watching Netflix? So that I'm able to actually sleep. I'm smiling because I do a lot of the Epsom salt soak and it really works. It magic. worked for me, by the way. It worked for me. I had such a big sleep problem because of all the stress and I had to figure out solutions that would work for me. Only then can I share it with other people and Epsom salt soak was one of those. And so these are the quick hacks and tips that I would share with people to please proactively manage uh, sleep and stress. It has crept into our lives um, and is less talked about than diet and life uh, and physical activity. Um, so please be mindful of it and see how we can actually proactively manage it. And and lack of good sleep has been found to be a big contributing factor to these sudden cardiac deaths that we just spoke about. Yeah, you know, Dr. Manesh, the, I remember reading this line from the Netflix CEO. He said, we are on a war with sleep. So if you think about it, you can binge watch into your Saturday night and Sunday night and yeah. turn up like a zombie at work and then have to download that 25 GB and work for the next five days. That brain processor is overheating and yeah. that's your stress at the end of the day. And it's not changing anytime soon. Yeah. Our lifestyle is not going to change anytime and soon. I think the wisdom has to come from the ancient behaviors that we had or the texts that we had, but the modern day screening that kind of gives you a little bit of cold water thrown on your face True. saying, wake up, buddy. Yes. You know, the, you have these issues. The speaking of cold water being thrown on all of our face, as a sports nutritionist, I constantly have to motivate my athletes. And I've been practicing for two decades now. And I'm noticing a lot more of the younger generation, maybe in the last 10 years. I don't know whether it's the environment, the food, or the pressure of the fast pace of life, but mental health problems have cropped up. Mm. How do we first find that I have a mental problem? How do I know? Is there any secret out there that says, oh, I'm facing this and I'm beginning to break down because I think a lot of my athletes are waiting too late before they come in. So from a healthcare perspective, how can we manage it? Or how can, I, I think before we manage it, one is to detect it and then is to manage it. So any words of wisdom or insights that you guys have? In our hospital experience, um, we've seen that the stigma that used to be associated with, with mental health issues has come down significantly after COVID. COVID actually was the inflection point where people started talking about it a lot. So in fact, our you know, OPD consults for uh, psychologists and psychiatrists have almost you know, multiplied three, three times uh, since COVID. So that's the kind of influx we are seeing because people are accepting mental health issues. as So there's a normalization of mental health issues. Um, so I think they were also always there. I mean, these issues where I think people are recognizing them early on and we're asking talking for about help, it. asking for help. So I think the first step is to recognize and seek help, which I think is, you know, changed a lot in the last three years. So that's, I think, one step. And then, of course, there are several therapies available now, uh, you know, psychotherapies. There are There is medication management, which is available. Um, so And mental health from that standpoint is fairly controllable now, many of these conditions, because I think there are a lot of, new drugs available in the market. Uh, you know, I've seen friends and family seek help and get treated, you know, very fast, which wasn't the case perhaps 10 years, 10, 20 years back. So I think that's a big advancement that has happened. So I, I guess seek early help. Facilities are available now. COVID has changed that. And many drugs that are available today. I mean, not to speak of other therapies like yoga and meditation, um, but I think there's room for many such therapies out there in the market today. I think in addition, um, the point we discussed earlier about a community around you, um, it may be hard for you to recognize it and come to terms with it. But if you have a community around you that you have been mindful with, then um, they will recognize it for you. right? And I think it uh, therefore is every one of our responsibilities to watch for the people around us. Uh, whether it is at work, whether it is in our social communities or in our families, um, and to pick up uh, these little signs. Um, it could be someone who is not paying attention uh, the way they used to, someone who's very distracted, someone who slips away into social isolation, doesn't join a number of the activities that we do. 
and then be able to have a conversation or get somebody who is trained to have a conversation and help that individual recognize it. Um, we, I think, have heard that sitting is the new smoking. Mm. Um, what we've realized in a post-pandemic world is that loneliness and social isolation is the new sitting and the new smoking. I've heard that it's as bad as smoking 15, 20 cigarettes a day in terms of the kind of damage that it does without you even realizing it. Wow, that's profound. Loneliness and? Social isolation. Social isolation. Yeah, and we come to think of it, no? we're always in our phones and we tend to find that as an easier companion than the community around us. A and you know what's more worrying is the impact mental health issues are having on our kids today and adolescents. That, I think, is a ticking time bomb. Because as adults, we still have some, um, you know, agency to deal with these issues because of our experience. But kids have nowhere to go. Adolescents have nowhere to go. They take a long time figuring it out what's wrong with them. So, ticking time bomb. I mean, there's a lot that we have to do uh, to help society at large. Now, as a country, uh, the whole country, uh, there are a lot of these casualties happening from non-communicable diseases. What can we do to reduce that? Um, I think uh, definitely screening. And we've designed ProHealth to be able to take care of it at a personalized level and to be able to help you figure out what the next steps are um, once you've done that. I also am going to appeal to um, companies and organizations that uh, do and have the luxury of funding CSR. So our screenings need to go beyond those who can afford it. So one second. You mean to say if a company has more profit, they have to give that to a corporate social responsibility, they could actually take that money and test people and screen people? Yes, those who can't necessarily af afford it. They could take care of the uh, urban poor, uh, rural areas, semi-urban areas. They could look at uh, areas around their factories, around their ports, um, and adopt those communities and screen them so that we're able to actually reach much, much more of India um, and ensure that uh, you know we have this silent epidemic that is going unnoticed under control in the country. Doctors, your vision and the mission that you're on at Apollo Preventive Healthcare, if you had to sum it up and tell us what is it that India needs from Apollo Preventive Healthcare? I think we need to be NCD free by 2040 as a country. That's a tough ask. And uh, We've always risen to a challenge as a country and uh, we have gotten independence for the country and I think this is an alternate form of independence for ourselves, right? Um, to ensure that we are living healthy for ourselves, our families and for the country. Awesome. It's been a pleasure talking to both of you today. Um, if there's one thing that you did for your own personal health as a secret, both of you, could you share that with our viewers? I started, um, you know, I had a 10,000 step challenge, which I started four months back. You know, I, I mean, I used to play sports, but now I've, you know, like you said, um, two hours every day uh, for a month to lose one kg. I think I started on that drive four months back and it's really helping me a lot. So 10,000 steps is your secret. Is my secret. Secret goal. Yes. Oh, I need to do this. I mean, a lot of other things. Is it difficult to do that? No, actually, it's very inv invigorating. In, I mean, I, I actually thought thought that, you know, playing sports was the be all and end all. But I realized walking is a big contributor to good health and also changed dietary habits. Less of red meat, more of salads and all, which I thought I would never need. Uh, but I think that's come as a wake up call some months back because of some tests I ran. And um, so it was the testings that were part of the trigger. Yes, screening was part of the trigger, and which you know kind of you know nudged me towards adopting these healthy um, lifestyle changes. What about you, Doctor? I shared so many over yeah. <laughs> <laughs> during the, the, the podcast. Let me um, share one more. 
Um, I think sugar. Sugar in our diet as a family um, is something that we did. Uh, my children grew up with uh, no sugar in their milk, uh, no additives whatsoever. But we as adults uh, were pampered and had a lot of sugar in our lives. Um, and the reason I say we went uh, and did this as a family is because it helps the kitchen when you do things together. Mm -hmm. And it helps each other um, go through that withdrawal that yeah. I had when we stopped sugar. It took us about uh, 10 to 14 days. Was there rebellion from your kids? No, the kids were okay because they never uh, had sugar. Um, I ensured. I, they, I were, I knew. they weren't given a choice. They weren't given a choice. <laughs> <laughs> and so now they, when you add too much sugar, they can't even handle it, right? But I think sugar in beverages, that alone if yeah. we take care of. Then I'm not saying we don't enjoy the occasional Mysore Park, right? Or Roshagulla. We should. That's part of uh, life and that's part of actually having a good time. But it doesn't become mainstay as a regular dosing. That's right. Because we as Indians actually are consuming on average five times more sugar than the WHO guidelines. Once again, we're consuming. So we're getting to become a developed nation. And in that trajectory, we're consuming five times more sugar. That's right. And the sugar comes in the form of, you know, in your beverages, much, much more than you need. Um, in biscuits and cookies that we snack on, ketchup, bread. I mean, I could go on, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you're absolutely right because I remember creating a video on the National Survey of Consumption talking about India in the 1990s and India now in 2023. The, the recent consumption survey? The that came, yeah, yeah. And so 100 rupees spent, earlier it was 54 rupees towards food. Obviously, we didn't have yeah, that yeah. much money. Correct, yes. correct. But now it's come down to 40, 40 rupees. Correct. But out of 40 rupees, 10 rupees 50 paisas towards processed foods and right. beverages. Right. And only 3 rupees 80 paisa towards fruit and 3 rupees 80 paisa towards vegetables. Right. My goodness. Goodness. That tells you right there what we're doing to ourselves. Absolutely. So I think for everyone who is watching in, you are educated. You have the knowledge. You have the ability to choose what you put into your body. You have the ability to purchase what you put into your body. Uh, you have the ability to purchase a screening program. You have the ability to understand the screening test. And finally, you have the ability to take the decision either to have Epsom salts in your bath or walk 10,000 steps or in my case having too much of non-veg where my uric acid went through the roof right. and my, I was wondering why are my fingers hurting? Let's go and get a screening done. There was a yogic guru who said this, no? I was going on a flight and the, air, the, the airline baggage handler says, sir, you are overweight. And he said, who? Me or my bags? <laughs> so I think everyone has to go in, who has, everyone has to go in that direction, yet, you know, only your bags are overweight, uh, but, but not yourself. Not yourself, absolutely. Yeah. Less is more. Less is more, absolutely. Yes. So this has been a wonderful time with both you doctors. Thank you so much. I wish you all the success on your mission. I hope you change millions and millions of lives. And uh, let's show India what is in store for a healthy nation. If you've liked this episode, then please gift me a like, a share or a subscribe. Or better still, if you comment, I'll come back to you. And don't forget, let's stay tuned for a new learning coming in. But till then, your body is the most expensive real estate. Take care of it.